Today we're going to uh, talk about uh, culture and the arts. Today we're going to dance. Uh, we may even sing a little bit. Um, but first we're going to go back to something we looked at yesterday, and that's that uh, visual timeline that uh, I showed that uh, tries to depict and, and quantify all of the fields of interaction between Russians and Americans over the years. And as you look at this, I admit it, it's a little bit hard to see. Um, one thing that stands out is the constancy of cultural contacts between the two countries. Uh, if you start way back here, it's, it's really this kind of bottom red line, if you can see the arrow. Uh, and if you go back to the beginning, that, again, it's very hard to see, but that uh, cultural contact line is about half of all the contacts. And although now, obviously, it's dwarfed by the enormous increase in things like uh, arms control verification, scientific exchanges, space cooperation, um, culture and the arts has always played a very special uh, role in helping to shape the perceptions that Americans and Russians have of each other. And I think one of the reasons that the U.S.-Russia relationship has really never lost the, uh, completely lost that strain of pragmatism that we talked about yesterday is that it was kept alive and, and kept alive sometimes at the bleakest moments of political confrontation uh, by the bonds and the bridges that were built between Americans and Russians through the culture through culture and through the arts. Now, this isn't a new phenomenon at all. Uh, cultural exchanges have helped to inform people about the world beyond their borders, probably from the earliest days of statecraft. And most major nations over the years, decades, even centuries, have devoted substantial resources and effort to developing state-sponsored cultural outreach programs. And this was done both as a means to try to promote peace and mutual understanding, but also obviously to further foreign policy objectives. Uh, in the case of the USSR and uh, the United States, of course, the foreign policy aspect assumed extraordinary importance in the second half of the 20th century after World War II. Uh, both countries tried to use the openings that had been provided by things like uh, modern communication methods, the uh, regularization of air travel, jet air travel, you could get places so much faster, to gain advantage in what really became a true ideological competition between the two systems. Now, as you read, the State Department first established its Department of Cultural Relations, as it was called, under President uh, Roosevelt in 1938. And by the end of World War II, there was already an internal debate going on in Washington inside the government over which direction American cultural relations programs should take. Uh, some people argued that they should be used to implement foreign policy as a real arm of foreign policy verging toward propaganda. Uh, others uh, argued just as strongly that they should provide a vehicle for the exchange of ideas, deepening of mutual understanding, and to help the target audience in making up their own mind, their own determination about their own desires and their own destiny. So which of these two was gonna win the internal debate? Well, the answer would always be obviously a little bit of both. Uh, but in the United States, at least, by the 1950s, the prevailing sentiment among American officials was that the government should serve as the facilitator of cultural exchanges and not try to manage them. Uh, in the Soviet Union, of course, those priorities were largely reversed uh, given the primacy of ideology and, and communist doctrine. But there was still enough common ground by the late 1950s uh, to allow the government to reach a formal agreement that formally blessed and promoted the concept of cultural exchange between the countries and also established some parameters, some guidelines, some benchmarks. This was the 1958 cultural exchange agreement uh, between the U.S. and the USSR, the Lacey-Zerubin agreement uh, that you read about. Uh, and it is a document that I think I would argue 
contributed as much to lowering the international tension and the growth of healthier ties between the United States and Russia over the past 60 years as any of the arms control treaties that we've negotiated, maybe more. And as often happens in our uh, history, our shared history that we talked about, uh, it's the shared love of arts that opened the path to uh, that agreement. Uh, that really shouldn't have been surprising. If you recall Tchaikovsky's triumphant tour of the United States in the uh, late uh, 1800s, he was the conductor at the grand opening of Carnegie Hall in 1891, Tchaikovsky was. Uh, or it shouldn't be surprising if you knew that a refugee from the Russian Empire, who came to be called Irving Berlin, wrote some of, of America's best loved patriotic songs, a Russian Jew. Uh, but it took more than pragmatism. It took more than just a love of music. It also took vision and it took a lot of political courage for another Russian immigrant. And that's the legendary Saul Hurek, a guy named Saul Hurek in the 1950s. He brought the pianist Emil Gilles and the, violi uh, the violinist David Oistrach to New York in 1955. Now in America in the 1950s, the anti-communist hysteria of the McCarthy period was still sort of hanging in the air like a bad smell. And in Russia in 1955, obviously, Stalin had been dead for just a couple of years. And we were still a year away from Khrushchev's speech at the 56th Communist Party Congress in which he launched the de-Stalinization movement. Uh, so it was an equally complicated and risky business at that time for the Americans to arrange in the Soviet Union an American production of Porgy and Bess in Moscow. But they did it and it was an absolute sensation. Still talked about in Russia and much written about over the years. Um, in both of these instances, it was the impresarios and the cultural artists who took the lead. But the diplomats and the politicians in both countries were paying attention. And the cultural agreement that was signed in 1958 uh, provided for exchanges, not just in the arts, but in dozens of different fields. Uh, from the American side, the agreement was a direct outgrowth of presidential leadership. President Eisenhower had an interest in encouraging direct people-to-people -people exchanges. And he described the rationale behind the agreement using these words. He said, if we're going to take advantage of the assumption that all people want peace, then the problem is for people to get together and to leap governments, if necessary, to evade governments, to work out not one method, but thousands of methods by which people can gradually learn a little bit more about each other. If necessary, to evade governments. Who knew that Eisenhower was such a dissident? But clearly he was expressing a belief that he did not fear was gonna have negative political consequences for him. It was really a call to action on the part of Eisenhower and not just Eisenhower. Uh, that same conviction was expressed a little bit later on from a slightly different angle by Senator William Fulbright, uh, the man who created that iconic educational exchange program that still bears his name, the Fulbright program, and is still going strong after six decades. Uh, Fulbright's observation was this, slightly paraphrased. Uh, he said, over the long course of history, Having someone who understands how you think buys you more security than another submarine. Now Fulbright was asked at one point, what's the ultimate goal of your exchange program, the Fulbright program? He said, to avoid a nuclear war. He said, you might think that's pretentious, but that's the main purpose of the Fulbright program. So the history of the 1958 cultural agreement and the cultural, educational, scientific exchanges between the Soviet Union and the United States becomes personal for me a bit at this point in the timeline. Because at least two of the methods that Eisenhower and Fulbright envisioned set me on the path to my career in the State Department, in the US diplomatic service. 
Now we focus and have been focusing mostly on the role that was played by arts as an essential component of this international understanding that we're always trying to forge. But the uh, 1958 cultural agreement was also as far-sighted in its focus on other aspects of private interactions. The agreement expanded and regularized the exchange of scholars and students, including a program of Russian language and literature study at Leningrad State University for American undergraduates. Some of you, I think, may be uh, alumni of that program as it's evolved over the years. Uh, for me, uh, it allowed me to make my first trip to Russia in 1976. Uh, I lived in a so Soviet dormitory. I had a Soviet Russian roommate. And interestingly, it was that uh, Russian roommate who provided me with my first direct entree into culture in Russia. He had a part-time job working backstage at the Kirov Ballet in, in uh, Leningrad, now the Marinsky Ballet and Opera in St. Petersburg. And he would occasionally sneak us, his American roommates, in through the backstage door as long as we dressed like Soviets. And if we had to speak, we would claim that we were Latvians to sort of explain our funny accents. And he, he was a great guy. His name was Volodya. He, he also had ticket connections. And with his help, I was able to attend dozens of operas, ballets, and concerts. You could buy in those days a ticket to uh, a concert, the, the Leningrad Philharmonic, for a ruble 57 kopecks, which was worth a lot more then than now, but still. Uh, it's really an amazing kind of life-changing experience for me. The, uh, I arrived in uh, St. Petersburg in Leningrad in um, the dark, long days of winter, those long winter days gave way to the long twilights of spring. And I spent a lot of time in St. Petersburg exploring the canals and the courtyards. I still consider this to be one of the most beautiful cities in the world, certainly one of the most beautiful cities I've ever visited, and I visited a lot. Um, it was really, as I said, a life-changing experience for me. I had gone to Leningrad uh, intending to return home and start to work on a graduate degree in Slavic linguistics. I was very into the linguistics and literature side of things. But when I was in, Saint, when I was in Leningrad, something sort of unexpected happened. During that semester in the USSR, the semester that was made possible by the Cultural Exchange Agreement, I came face to face with the many social and political paradoxes of life that characterized life in the Soviet Union in those days. Here was the nuclear superpower that had put the first man on the moon, and, but it was still struggling to provide a decent standard of living. Uh, here was I standing in long cold lines to buy a couple of oranges or a roll of toilet paper. And uh, standing in those long lines gave me a lot of time to think about those paradoxes. And I had long arguments about this in the dormitory with my Russian roommate with Volodya. Uh, but once we were outside the dorm walking to class across the bridge, he would tell me, oh, don't pay attention to what I said. I really agree with everything that you said in there. Something really puzzling was going on for me. And I had to solve that puzzle. And so I found myself drawn deeper into the study of Russian history, international relations, and basically, I was sitting in the same seat that you all are sitting in right now. And once again, as luck and fate would have it, that pragmatic, multifaceted cultural agreement provided me with a new opportunity. Under that agreement, the USSR and the United States had agreed to exchange traveling exhibitions on a diverse palette of cultural and social themes, sports, medicine, agriculture, the role of women in society, hand tools, uh, name a subject. And between 1959 and 1991, there was probably an exhibition devoted to it showing in a major US or Soviet city. And I worked on two of those traveling exhibitions for three years in the late 1970s. I lived uh, in about a dozen different cities across the USSR for a couple of months in each city. 
the exhibitions always uh, had a theme, as I said, agriculture, photography. They always showcased the latest and the best cameras or the tractors or hospital equipment that America produced. But the hardware was never the center of the show. By far, the main attraction were the 25 exhibit guides. Almost all of us were college students, fluent in Russian, uh, who demonstrated the displays and answered the questions for the Soviet visitors. And um, in most cases, these visitors had waited in line for up to or over an hour to get into the exhibit. Uh, there were about 20 of these American exhibitions that toured the Soviet Union, starting in 1959 with the famous uh, exhibit in Sokolniki, which was the platform for the kitchen debate between Nixon and Khrushchev. Uh, the program ran until 1991. This is uh, yours truly. I love that sweater. Uh, showing a Polaroid picture to kids in Ufa. I don't know if you can see the picture of that kid closest to me looking up with just a, <laughs> a look of wonder in his face. I'd like to go, by, go back and find that kid sometime. Uh, so this program uh, ran until 1991. Uh, there I am again. I'd love to find that shirt too if I could. Uh, and through the program, we took attendance and kept records, and almost 20 million Soviet citizens were brought into direct personal contact with the United States and with an American who spoke Russian through those exhibits. And many of them were left with profound impressions, and impressions that really lasted for decades. Uh, over the years, I saw a lot of firsthand evidence of this lasting impact. In 2003, I was the deputy chief of, Michigan, of mission in the uh, U.S. Embassy in Moscow, and I visited the city of Ufa. Uh, it was a city in the Urals where I had worked as a guide on the Photography USA exhibit 26 years earlier. The picture that you just saw of me holding up the Polaroid camera was taken in Ufa. And I met the head of the American Center there, the guy on my left or on my right, who said that he had visited the exhibit as a kid in 1977. And he had brought home the brochure that we handed out by the thousands. Sometimes we had 10,000 people a day coming through the exhibit. He took that home and he brought it to show me 26 years later, he said that brochure that I'm holding in my hand there had probably been read by hundreds of Soviets and Russians over the years, friends, family members. It was passed around. Uh, really amazing, lasting impact that these exhibitions and these contacts had. Very, very hard to, easy to quantify, hard to qualify, uh, unless you met the people who came up to you decades later and said, I remember you. Uh, when I was ambassador, I uh, was at a conference and I sat next to a regional leader. Uh, and he said that as a teenager, he had visited the exhibition that I had worked on in Novosibirsk. And he could still describe in unbelievable detail the layout of the exhibit, the content of all of the exhibit stands, the conversations that he had had or that he had overheard between the guides and the Soviet visitors, really, truly amazing. Uh, in 1979, I was able to flip and do the other side and I accompanied a Soviet exhibition devoted to sports in the USSR that was traveling around the United States on a four city tour, Knoxville, Atlanta, Kansas City, San Antonio. They also set up the exhibit they had English-speaking Russians. The crowds that came to those exhibits were a little bit smaller than the ones that uh, came to the American exhibits in the Soviet Union, but the reactions of the Americans who came to the Soviet exhibit and had their first face-to-face -face encounter with a Russian speaking fluent English, those reactions were very familiar to me. Now, none of the guides, none of us on these American exhibitions was a career diplomat yet. Uh, for the most part, as I said, we were college students. We were, some were language teachers uh, in our 20s or early 30s. But what I learned, I talked about this a little bit yesterday, what I learned from those discussions and debates, thousands of hours, literally, if you add up the years, uh, six hours a day, six days a week, 
uh, for three years with some breaks. Um, in a dozen cities across the USSR, from Rostov, Nadanu, Dushanbe, Kishinev, Novosibirsk, all of that stayed with me. And there's absolutely no doubt that it made me a much more effective diplomat when I joined the State Department in 1983. I learned a lot about the Soviet educational system from those discussions. I learned about the, the emphasis the Soviets put on mastery of facts. Uh, I learned a lot about my own history. Some of the Soviet visitors to the exhibit knew more about American history than I did. I had to do a lot of catching up. We had a big encyclopedia set that traveled with us and we would all study it really hard when we found we didn't know enough about what we needed to know. We learned uh, how Soviet citizens were taught the history of the 19th and 20th century. Very interesting. Uh, the centrality of the World War II experience came up every single day. We mentioned that a few times over the last couple of days. Uh, I also learned how the drilling that Soviet students got in rhetorical technique made them formidable debaters. Uh, and I learned even more about how Russians think, how they can sort of construct a logical argument, how they respond when you challenge them, how they react to rude behavior, uh, how they react to kindness. Many, many of the guides from these exhibits went on to careers in diplomacy, not just me, uh, and also business or journalism with a focus on Russia. You met Rose Gottemuller earlier, uh, who lectured to you. Uh, I don't know, Jill Doherty has spoken to you. I mean, there are really scores of us, alumni of that program, who are kind of sprinkled throughout the government, academia, always with a special focus on Russia. It was really a uniquely effective example of the power of what we later came to call public diplomacy. And it was just a, a fantastic training ground for us. Uh, over the years, all of these exchanges under the cultural agreement in all spheres, education and science, the performing arts, literature, all of this served as something of a barometer of US-Soviet ties. When uh, bilateral relations were good, then exchanges flourished and expanded. Uh, when relations were not good, the programs and the contacts contracted and suffered but they never were entirely extinguished and they continued even through some of the tensest interludes in our history. During the um, Cuban Missile Crisis in October of 1962, the uh, New York City Ballet was on tour in the USSR and it maintained its schedule of performances in Moscow and Leningrad, playing to sold out houses night after night. This, again, was a moment at which the U.S. and the USSR were perhaps just a few heartbeats away from a nuclear war. And at the very same time, October um, 1962, at that same time, the Bolshoi Ballet was on tour in the United States and not a single performance was canceled or disrupted. No cancel culture in those days. Uh, 1983 to 1985, uh, which were my first two years as a junior diplomat in Moscow, those were a couple of the, definitely the chilliest years of the Cold War in U.S.-Soviet relations. We talked about those yesterday. Uh, Ronald Reagan, evil empire, shoot down of the uh, Korean airline over Sakhalin Island. But Fulbright scholars continued their studies in both countries through that period. And uh, in Moscow, the, the American jazz singer and Broadway star Pearl Bailey, you may have heard of, uh, did Hello Dolly on Broadway for decades. Uh, she came to Russia to give performances in Moscow and St. Petersburg. And because the relationship was pretty fraught, the Soviet authorities balked at providing an auditorium for her shows in Moscow. We had an agreement with them, which was yanked at the last minute. So we created a concert hall for her in the ballroom of the ambassador's residence in Moscow, Spaso House. And she played to a crowd of Soviet fans there, standing room only, 500 people crammed into the room, hot as hell. Uh, those Soviets decided that their love of American jazz outweighed the pretty considerable risk in those days of accepting an invitation to the American embassy. Uh, 
that tradition, the tradition of using uh, the ambassador's residence uh, in Moscow and also in Washington as a kind of special showcase for cultural events is a, a unique and delightful intersection of arts and international relations that's continued and continues to, to right now. Uh, this is the ice palace that uh, Russian ambassador Kislyak transformed his embassy into when he hosted the Opera Ball in Washington in 2010. In uh, the 1980s, uh, my first tour in Moscow, uh, I mentioned Pro Bailey at the U.S. Ambassador's residence, but there was a lot more going on that we used that Spasa House for as a venue. We used it for concerts and film showings to which we invited Soviet dissidents and, and refuseniks. Uh, they were usually harassed, the Spasso House there on the left and uh, the interior uh, on the right. The dissidents and the refuseniks were usually hassled or harassed by the KGB goons uh, at the front gate, but more often than not, they got in. And from them, we diplomats learned a lot about what was happening internally about the despair, about the bisperspectiveness, which was beginning to infect the Soviet people and the Soviet elite by the mid 1980s. Uh, when I returned as ambassador uh, about 20 years later, uh, my wife never dreaming that I was actually gonna come back and live in this house. And, and I hope that one or maybe even two of you uh, someday we'll also get to live in that house, just like I did, never dreaming that I would. But when I came back 20 years later, we had this great experience. And so we were determined to continue this with great enthusiasm. We used Spasso House as a venue to promote the cultural links between Russia and the United States, to reach out to parts of uh, the Russian elite who uh, maybe were a bit on the fence. You could always get people to come who were pro-American. The uh, challenge was always to get people who weren't quite sure that they wanted to come to the American embassy, even when relations were good. Uh, and so we hosted countless concerts of Russian and American performing artists. Uh, I hosted the first hip hop conference uh, con concert ever in uh, Spasso House in uh, 2010. And uh, also in 2010, we staged a ball to commemorate the 75th anniversary of a famous earlier party, also hosted in Spasso House by one of my predecessors, the first ambassador to the USSR, William Bullitt. Uh, his ball, a very extravagant party in 1935, was attended in this very same room by some of Moscow's political and cultural elite, a real who's who uh, of the Soviet creme de la creme in those days. And the crowd included the writer Mikhail Bulgakov. And Bulgakov was inspired by the kind of grandiose spectacle that Bullet mounted to create one of the most famous scenes from his masterpiece, The, Margar the Master and Margarita. Uh, Remembering that event, the fact that Bulgakov came to Spasso House and was somehow inspired to write a chapter of The Master and Margarita, it seemed to my wife and me to be a perfect way to celebrate that intertwining of diplomacy and history and the arts that really had enriched the culture and the peoples of both countries for so many years. Uh, Jarliff, with your help, I wanna now run just a brief uh, clip uh, from that event in 2010. It's called the Enchanted Ball. Okay, just one moment. Bulgakov. 
the part where we dance. Come on, get up. Yes. So you see, it's sometimes fun to be an ambassador. It's, it's not just uh, daunting meetings with Vladimir Putin. For, for a diplomat, really, I guess helping to negotiate an arms control treaty is the culmination of what you do. It's a great uh, challenge intellectually, professionally, obviously immensely consequential, but there's not a lot of beauty or grace or style involved in that. Uh, and that's why rather than deliver another lecture on the interagency process in Washington, which I think might be the equivalent of Fulbright's another nuclear submarine, I decided uh, instead uh, to expand a bit on the conversation that we started yesterday to talk about the intersection of culture and the arts and diplomacy. Uh, because it doesn't just build bridges of understanding, it also enriches the lives of people. And I think that matters at the end of the day every bit as much as the political relationship between the two governments. So, Oh, one of the things I want to mention, one of the reasons you saw those kind of kooky uh, paper mache animals in the video was in the original ball in 1935, Ambassador Bullitt, who was a man of considerable means, uh, he had a jazz band flown in from Prague to play. He had animals 
delivered kind of on loan from the Moscow Zoo uh, that were kept in little enclosures, uh, including a bear cub, including some trained seals. Uh, it was really quite a show. Uh, we couldn't do that. So we did the best we could kind of in a whimsical way.